I called you here today because we face dire circumstances. Our intelligence has confirmed the existence of a new threat that is unlike any we have seen before. This organization has the ability to carry out attacks anywhere in the world. They are highly lethal and indiscriminate of age, religion, or nationality. The potential for loss of human life and psychological terror is substantial and cannot be ignored. They are the very definition of an unknown quantity. Our only choice of action is to meet force with force. As of this moment, my program is reactivated, and I am handing over command of all global field operations to you. Recruit your operators from among the world's foremost elite. Borders and protocols are irrelevant. Guards the civilized world from those who wish to do it harm. No matter how or where our enemies strike, no matter what defense they cower behind, Team Rainbow must stand ready. Sheesh, last week I talked about turn-based strategies, now I'm already back to FPS's and Rainbow Six Siege. That is some digital whiplash. Tune in next week when I review Peppa Pig and how she represents the Chinese socialist invasion of foreign ideologies on classical American values. Rainbow Six Siege, this game has risen to the popularity levels of Call of Duty, and it kinda came out of nowhere. Originally, Ubisoft was set to release a game called Rainbow Six Patriots, but that was cancelled in 2014, and the development team was left to salvage the game, and they created Rainbow Six Siege in the wake of this cancelled project, making it arguably a happy little accident. But take a look at the esports statistics for Rainbow Six over the years. It has risen to the levels of Call of Duty and beyond in popularity. It's a game that people tune in for. It's a game that people want to play. It's a game that people want to watch. Dare I call it a COD killer? Hmm. Stop it. Man. You can't keep comparing Rainbow Six Siege to Call of Duty. It's not the same game. It's a tactical shooter. It's a freaking search and destroy match, okay? Rainbow Six Siege is just search and destroy inside a building with specific characters that have gadgets that are specific to them that also have more interesting and eventful rounds than Call of Duty does. Sorry. We're sorry. Now, to be fair, this game has well over two decades of experience under its belt, but up until fairly recently, this was a pretty niche title. I'd say the most well-known games before Rainbow Six Siege were Rainbow Six Vegas 1 and 2, both of which were exceedingly popular, but never as popular as games like Call of Duty or Halo. But they were some of the best tactical shooters of their time. This game franchise has become so influential to the current environment of games as a whole. If you're a fan of the single kill shot, no matter what gun you're using because it's a headshot, you can thank Tom Clancy for that one. This mechanic was pioneered by him in the original Rainbow Six game that came out in 1998. And oh my goodness. I've never played this game. But in doing the research for this video, I found out that the original Rainbow Six is one of the coolest games I've ever seen. But I can't talk about that in this video. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I'll make a video about that in the future. Boy, do I love loading responsibilities onto future Luke. You see, the difference between games like Call of Duty or Halo is that they have the legacies of their franchises to stand upon. I've said it in one of my other videos, they stand upon the shoulders of giants and they know it. Siege never had anything like that. Of course, it had several titles in the past over well over 20 years. I think it's coming up on 26 years at this point that the game franchise has existed. But no other Rainbow Six game has been 
ever as popular as something like Call of Duty or Halo or Battlefield or any other of the competing FPS games. The mainstream appeal of these games was not really there, but for the people who played them, they were beloved. Rainbow Six Vegas 2 was actually where I got my start playing Rainbow Six, and it was because of that game that I went out and bought Siege when it released, and the early days of Siege were just a different time for everyone. We're still in my f***ing character. <laughs> Fortify the room. You need to keep the hostage secure. But Siege never had the same kind of legacy to stand upon. COD and Halo were at their peaks in the late 2000s going into 2010. And this was around the same time that Rainbow Six Vegas 2 was being played and probably Rainbow Six Vegas 1 by people who just were absolutely in love with that game and hated the sequel to it. The Rainbow Six title did not enter the same level of fame and popularity as Call of Duty, Halo, Battlefield did at this time. No. The success of Rainbow Six Siege can be solely attributed to what the dev team at Ubisoft has been doing all these years with the game. It can be attributed almost solely to the quality of the game itself. The game gained traction because people loved it and people stuck around because Ubisoft added to it. The gameplay loop stayed consistently the same, but the meta was constantly being shifted because Ubisoft was adding new content to the game every season. Every three months, two new operators would join the field, and they would change up the way the game was played. They would change up tactics people would use. They would add new ways to move around the map or destroy walls or windows or get to the objective site or get the upper hand on your opponent. It created a fresh scene every three months. And this doesn't even take into account the the events that Ubisoft holds for the game, which themselves are so much fun, so much fun. Seconds. It created an atmosphere where even if you had forgotten about the game, or gotten bored of it, or just moved on to play other games because you just felt like playing something else, the new additions and the new changes would generate curiosity and intrigue and start drawing people back in. And they would warrant a revisit, even just to see what kinds of new changes were being added. And thus begins the relapse of the toxic, hate-fueled addiction to this gem of a game. I mean, this is a game that came out all the way back in 2015, and it still to this day performs exceptionally well on the Steam charts. I know I'm using Steam charts, but I played this game exclusively on Xbox. Please don't give me any hate for playing this game on Xbox, especially considering I'm not cracked on a controller like Jinxie is. I gotta be careful how many times I say that name. I might spawn him in or something if I say it too many times. Biggie Smalls, Biggie Smalls, Biggie Smalls. Slammed! But Ubisoft was not afraid of creativity or experimentation. I think Rainbow Six Extraction is proof of this one. But I mean, even if you just compare Rainbow Six Siege to the title that came before it, Rainbow Six Vegas 2, there are similarities to the game, of course, but oh man, they are very, very different games. Personally, I like the gameplay of Rainbow Six Vegas 2 a little bit better, where you get, you know, your AI companions that will help you fight the game and you can give them orders and tell them to do things. But Ubisoft was pretty creative when they came out with Siege. Just take a look at the operators. When this game was announced at E3, the trailer involved generic class-based soldiers and terrorists fighting each other inside a house over a hostage. But the team developing this game actually scrapped that idea entirely and instead opted for the hero shooter mechanic of putting in specific characters with specific gadgets that we all know and love today if we play this game. This was a feature that was seen in a game like Overwatch, but that game also featured melee characters and dedicated healers and a much different team dynamic and flow altogether. This operator concept wasn't something common to a pure quasi-military sim first-person shooter, but the team at Ubisoft took that leap and they created something fantastic and very, very different from what it once was. Rainbow Six Siege has come so far from where it began, but the base experience of the game is still relatively the same, just a little less toxic. Allah Akbar, 
<laughs> you have to coordinate with team members in order to most effectively attack or defend an objective inside a building. It's a game of cooperation, strategies, intel. This game is currently one of the best, if not the best, first person shooter experience that you can get on the market. I mean, I guess it depends on what you specifically want out of your FPS games. Like if you want more of an RPG experience and you play something like Destiny, or if you want extreme realism, you're better off playing something like Insurgency or Hell Let Loose. But in terms of raw mechanics, flow, and replayability, Rainbow Six Siege is at the top of its game. This, however, was not always the case, especially when this game initially launched. The launch of this game was plagued with horrible matchmaking, abysmal hit detection, and the infamous Operation Health that came a couple years after the release to address the myriad quality of life issues and overall poor performance of the game servers, matchmaking, and player experience as a whole. But this risky decision to pause content injection into their game actually gave Ubisoft the time and opportunity to dedicate teams of developers to working on new operators for a much more stable game. Operation Health also marked the first major overhaul in Ubisoft's extensive lists of reworks and re balances and reconfigurations in Siege. Sometimes the reworks would be very minor, sometimes they would be so major that they changed the entire gameplay mechanics themselves, like the most recent update where they completely reworked how the shields in this game function. They would go on to update everything from the game modes to the graphics to the operator balancing to the maps themselves. Speaking of which, every map in this game, except for the most recent ones, has pretty much been completely reworked by Ubisoft. The interiors and exteriors have completely changed to accommodate for things like spawn peeking and impenetrable defensive positions. Some of the maps just turned into flat out memes by the community because of the way they were set up with the destructible walls and the environment. But this destructibility and the verticality is one of the most important aspects of the game. It's one of the things that makes it so unique. The maps themselves and the destruction characteristics of the map, I think are one of Siege's biggest selling points. All of them are interesting. They're different from each other. Some of them are way more annoying than others. This is one of the features that makes this game so much fun to play because the satisfaction that you get from laying a breaching charge on a wall or a door and opening up a new line of sight into an objective or getting the upper hand on the defenders, that's a great feeling. It's also a necessary way to play if you want to play ranked and have any kind of success at all. The destruction of the map is one of the most influential things that can happen in a round. Ubisoft successfully created a fun gameplay loop that people enjoy coming back to and sticking around for. This is in spite of how simple it really is. I mean, you're effectively doing the same thing every round if you really want to reduce it down. But this game shines in the minutia. The steps you take in order to get to a win are going to vary dramatically from round to round. It's almost like a game of chess. You're reacting to your opponent's playstyle, you're reacting to your opponent's character choices, you're reacting to your opponent's angle of attack. But on top of this, Ubisoft regularly comes out with seasonal events to support the main game itself. And these events vary wildly from the core gameplay. They are an absolute blast. They have things like Showdown, which is a 3v3 Wild West Cowboy themed event where everyone has revolvers and the two shot slug round shotgun that Vigil and Dokebi have. They have a Halloween event where it's hide and seek and the attackers all have sledgehammers and the defenders all can turn invisible and have defense gadgets so that they can hide and try and kill the attackers without weapons or anything. Meanwhile, the attackers have tracking gadgets so they can try to find the hiders. Things like Pulse's heartbeat sensor, Lion's motion sensor, Jackal's footstep sniffer, I mean sensor. There's a winter playlist in the past that featured snowballs, but I didn't really like that one so I didn't really play it. But they came out with a different winter event that I actually really liked. Most recently, it featured a 10 player free for all, and there were two people each round that spawned as an iceborne with with 800 health and they could only run and dash at people and knife them. There was this mute protocol game mode where two teams of five, everybody starts with SMGs and each kill, it's like a gun game mode where you advance to the next gun and then the objective 
is to get to the last tier, which is a sledgehammer. And then you have to go to the center of the map and destroy a brain case. And this was a super interesting and fun game mode to play. They even had this large scale narrative event that was almost like a Left 4 Dead kind of game mode inside of Rainbow Six Siege. It was called Outbreak. And it's centered around the containment of this new zombifying alien virus. And apparently it was so successful that it convinced Ubisoft to make an entire spin-off game devoted to the whole process of containing this virus. I don't want to say too much about it, but I will say that at least it was better than some Left 4 Dead inspired games that came out around the same time. But there are a laundry list of events that Rainbow Six Siege has come out with to support the base gameplay. And it's just another layer of intrigue that draws people back into the game. If they've moved on, if they've forgotten about it, and they hear about one of these events, they say, oh, I might want to try that out. And then boom, they're back in the cycle of addiction. So for everything that's great about this game, it's obviously not perfect, and it has its flaws. And there are some things that I really don't like all that much about the game. Ubisoft took the kind of cheap approach to a narrative game and instead decided to just inject cutscenes into each new season to flesh out some kind of lore behind all these characters and some kind of interaction or story that goes on in the background. I don't know why so many games are opting to do this. Call of Duty, Halo, Rainbow Six Siege, it's just such a strange idea. If the players aren't playing through the story what is the point what who is going to be interested in that except for the people who are so hardcore that they're out there reading the novels for these games and that's another thing is that a lot of these narrative gaps are filled by comics and novels for these games nowadays it's such a weird trend because it's like we're playing video games and in order to understand the story and the setting that's going on we have to go out and read books and do homework there's this weird random quasi campaign that they're shoving in my face and advertising every three months and I have no idea what the heck is going on because I haven't done my homework. Why would anyone playing a video game be invested in that? 343 made the exact same mistake when they came out with Halo 5. There were so many narrative jumps and changes between Halo 4 and 5 that if players wanted to understand them, they had to go out and read 8 novels and play a random spin-off game that was nothing like Halo at all. Siege is literally doing the exact same thing and it just begs the question, can't you just put these things in a video game, guys? And of course, like every other AAA studio on the market, the microtransactions are garbage. They're still selling skins for $20 while Helldivers is out here selling skins for actual microtransaction prices. And spread managed democracy throughout the galaxy. This game is doing everything right. They actually made their microtransactions micro. Why am I going into this? You're paying for a game when you buy these cosmetics. It just baffles my mind that these AAA titles are selling game priced skins. One YouTuber, Kudos, pointed out how Ubisoft is actually currently failing Siege. One of the points he made in this video really stands out to me just as a general rule of thumb. Balancing can change and that isn't really a core issue. Whether you disagree with balancing changes or not, that's a completely different aspect. But the content we are getting is good. And I just really hate making videos like this because I don't want to downplay all the good stuff that the hardworking developers on this game are doing. But Ubisoft as an overall company are not doing Siege justice. Whether that is just due to lack of funding or other reasons, I don't know, but it's beyond a joke. Imagine if you're trying to play chess and the other person keeps taking an illegal move and cheating. As well as this, imagine someone keeps taking all your pieces or knocking them over or just hindering your ability to play chess. That is what it feels like to play Rainbow Six Siege. You have this beautifully crafted product right in front of you but there are so many hurdles you have to jump through before you can play that beautiful product. I may think that Rainbow Six Siege is art but I honestly feel that to Ubisoft it's simply just another cash cow. PC is pretty much unplayable in high ranks. It is littered with cheaters. You have people climbing the leaderboards with 19 KDs remaining unbanned for weeks at a time. Ubisoft just regards Siege as another stream of revenue and that's it. And while the developers want to deliver the best experience possible 
to the audience, the company just wants to price gouge the players. But Ubisoft allows rampant cheating to go unchecked on PC, and it makes the gameplay experience unbearable. This is actually one of those times where I am so thankful that I do not play anything on PC at all. I'm so thankful that I'm tethered to a controller, just like Jinxie. Oh no. And as if this aggressive cheating doesn't make the game unplayable enough, the seed servers have been plagued by issues this year. So yeah, while the cheating problem makes the game, oh, it's unplayable. The server problems make the game literally unplayable. And recently, while I was scripting for this video, I was watching some YouTube and I got an ad for Ubisoft Plus. And one of the things that this ad said was unlimited access to a growing catalog of games. That word, that key word, growing really points out the motivations to me. This makes me think that they simply just want to compete with the likes of Xbox Game Pass, PlayStation Plus Premium, EA Play. It makes me worry that they're going to start leaning into the philosophy of quantity over quality, which really would not be good news for live service games like Siege, which have been going on for so long that the game itself might be older than some of the people playing it. I don't know how many seven-year-olds there are playing Rainbow Six Siege right now, but if there are any out there, your parents are terrible. Perhaps Ubisoft is intentionally phasing out resources for Rainbow Six Siege because they want to move on to the next Rainbow Six title. That's something I can totally understand, and I genuinely want to see a narratively driven Rainbow Six game, especially in the wake of all the extensive operators and background and lore that we've gotten from Siege. There were so many operators in the game, and Ubisoft have fleshed them out to the point where they're interacting with each other, they have backstory and relationships with each other, and that can open up a whole realm of content to put into the background of whatever campaign you want to make for Rainbow Six. This game has grown and matured to a level of depth not commonly seen in first person shooter games, especially not ones with the gameplay loop of Rainbow Six Siege. It'd be like if you started getting invested in the characters of Call of Duty that you're running around like an ape shooting people with. Ubisoft absolutely should capitalize on that opportunity and make a killer campaign because they have all the tools necessary to do so. And they definitely have the resources. But maybe Siege should stick around and stay on as the background mainstay PvP experience of Rainbow Six. And the next Rainbow Six title could be a single player or co-op campaign focused around the grassroots way that Rainbow Six came about. Counter-terrorism. Not zombies, okay? We're sick of zombies. No one cares about zombies anymore. Are you sure about that? The heart of this game is counter-terrorism. The birth of this game was counter-terrorism. It was how Rainbow Six Siege even started. The whole premise of the game was training for counter-terrorist activities. And even now, it's still kind of like that. It's just in the background. It's part of these narrative plots that go on that no one sees until the new season comes out. But Ubisoft absolutely could deliver a counter-terrorism based game. And they've been quite successful in the past with titles like Ghost Recon Wildlands. I guess it just remains to be seen what their plans are for the title of Rainbow Six. Rainbow Six Siege is a very special game to me. Back in 2017, I had to get a bone marrow transplant and I was under quarantine for nine months. Yeah, I was under lockdown before it was cool. But during that time, I couldn't really do much besides sit at home. So I started playing a lot of video games and Rainbow Six Siege was one of the main titles that I played. It was a game that I grew very fond of during a very dark time in my life. I made close friends playing Rainbow Six Siege that I am still close to, to this day. And to this day, I am still making new friends playing Rainbow Six Siege with my close friends. So maybe I'm biased in my opinions of this game, or maybe the game really was good enough warrant all that time spent on it. Take care y'all.